Welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. This episode is brought to you by Lynda.com and we've got news of a great offer from them coming up later in the show. So do stay tuned all the way for that. Season 18, Episode 6, The Siege of Yorktown. This episode was written by Michael Gaby Gross. Michael received his master's degree in history from the California State University, Sacramento. His thesis project analysed the Phoenix program, a CIA counterinsurgency operation during the Vietnam War. On October the 17th, 1781, four years to the day when British General John Burgoyne surrendered his army to American forces at Saratoga, New York, Lord Charles Cornwallis requested terms of surrender from General George Washington. Two days later, the British marched between lines of French and American soldiers to the tune of The World Turned Upside Down. Upon hearing the news, British Prime Minister Lord North reeled throughout his arms, exclaiming wildly as he paced up and down, Oh God, it's all over! In 1783, the Treaty of Paris brought the American War of Independence to an end and victory for the Americans and their French allies. The victory at Yorktown marked the end of the British campaign in the South to divide the American colonies and encourage loyalists to flock to the King's banner. Instead of meeting a population willing to assist the British, they found a land deeply divided. Guerrilla warfare raged since the war's beginning between patriots and loyalists as each side sought to settle old scores. Cornwallis made frustrating marches through the Carolinas and into Virginia as he sought to destroy the American army under General Nathaniel Green. Despite several victories, the Americans escaped to fight another day, while the British lost more and more men. When efforts to crush the Americans failed and Green was soon reinforced by the Marquis de Lafayette, Cornwallis turned to the coast, hoping to link up with the Navy and return to New York. Instead, Cornwallis soon found himself surrounded in the small coastal town of Yorktown. Following the American victory at Saratoga, a stalemate replaced the early activity of the war. The British captured the rebel capital of Philadelphia, but soon returned to New York City after realising the American cause could not be crushed by the capture of one city. The Continental Army continued to suffer from lack of pay, poor supply, and a Continental Congress, the governing body of the United States during the war, seemingly deaf to the army's needs. Washington did everything in his power to keep his army together. There were those in Congress who disagreed with the way Washington waged the war and sought to replace him with the victor of Saratoga, Horatio Gates. The Conway Cabal, named after Thomas Conway, Inspector General of the Army and Major Washington critic, made subtle suggestions and spread letters urging Gates replace Washington as commander of the Continental Army. Conway reportedly wrote to Gates, Heaven has been determined to save your country, or a weak general and bad counsellors would have ruined it. Washington never saw the purported letter, but when Washington's supporters heard of the conspiracy, they leapt into action. When confronted directly, the Conway cabal shrank back and Gates wrote to Washington pleading his innocence in the entire affair. Even more frightful, in 1781, after suffering through another miserable winter with little food, few supplies and no pay, several Pennsylvania regiments, known as the Pennsylvania Line, decided they had had enough and attempted to muster out and return home. Several officers attempted to stop the men to no avail. General Anthony Wayne, commander of the Pennsylvania line, tried to convince his men to return to order and promised to forward their demands on to Washington and the Pennsylvania state government. The soldiers intended to march on Philadelphia and make their demands in person. 
British ambassadors from Clinton urging the mutineers to abandon the American cause were executed. The Americans refused to listen to these offers that they become turncoat and simply killed the messengers. These men were loyal patriots, but they had legitimate grievances with the lack of support they received from Congress. The president of the Pennsylvania Assembly, Joseph Reed, met with the leaders of the mutiny and negotiated a settlement. The men would receive back pay, provisions, and the right to discharge from the service if they had served three or more years. Wayne could do nothing but watch as half of his men mustered out. However, it was only a temporary setback. When Wayne later began recruiting new units, many who answered the call were former mutineers. The success of the Pennsylvania Line's mutiny led units of the New Jersey Line to refuse orders and attempt to confront Congress. This time Washington showed no mercy. He ordered the New Jersey camp surrounded and the ringleaders executed. Wayne gave the order to the firing squad, made up of men from the New Jersey line, to fire or face execution themselves. With tears in their eyes, they complied and the Continental Army returned its focus to the British. Although this was not to be the last mutiny before the end of the war, it did reveal how fragile the army was and urged Washington to break the stalemate before he no longer had an army with which to fight. Meanwhile, the French fleet under the Comte d'Estaing arrived in July 1778 to support their new allies and take dominance of the seas away from the British. The French soon discovered how ragged their American allies had become. Comte de Rochambeau wrote to his superiors, Send us troops, ships and money, but do not count on these people nor their resources. They have neither money nor credit, their forces only exist momentarily. Rochambeau, however, would soon discover how resilient the American soldier truly was. For the next few years, the French and Americans worked independently. The French from their base at Newport, Rhode Island, and the Americans at White Plains, New York. Both sides launched raids and fought skirmishes, probing for weaknesses. France's main objective upon entering the war was to enact revenge upon the British. France lost much after the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War in Europe, and saw the American War of Independence as a prime opportunity to take back lost territory. Destin led his fleet on a series of inconclusive manoeuvres. Winning the Battle of Grenada on July 6, 1779, while failing at the Siege of Savannah, before returning to France. The French returned in 1780, this time with the Comte de Rochambeau at the head of 6,000 soldiers ready to coordinate with Washington. British efforts in the New England and Middle Colonies ended in failure. British generals Thomas Gage and William Howe lost their commands when they failed to bring a quick conclusion to the war. Despite the nearby presence of Washington's army in December 1778, the British, now under Sir Henry Clinton, began a new campaign in the south with the capture of Savannah, Georgia. The British command believed that while the northern colonies were lost to the Patriots, the southern colonies held large numbers of loyalists waiting for a British army to free them from the rebel yoke. Lord Cornwallis returned to America in July 1779 with the intention of leading this new southern strategy to victory. This reinforced army now outnumbered the American army under General Benjamin Lincoln by more than two to one. Clinton and Cornwallis soon forced the surrender of Charleston, South Carolina and Lincoln's army of around 5,000 men. Clinton returned to New York City and left Cornwallis with instructions to continue the campaign by conquering the rest of South Carolina and move into North Carolina. It seemed this southern strategy was well on its way to success. To counter this new threat, Congress sent to General Gates, still without a command since Saratoga, with a new army to stop the British advance. At the Battle of Camden on August 16, 1780,
Gates suffered one of the worst defeats in the history of the United States military. Historian Richard M. Ketchum wrote, The rout was so complete that no one knew how many Americans were lost. Gates fled the field ahead of his men, leaving them to their fate. Alexander Hamilton, then aide to Washington, wrote to a friend, Was there ever an instance of a general running away from his whole army, and was there ever so precipitous a flight? One hundred and eighty miles in three days and a half? It does admirable credit to the activity of a man at his time of life. Although Gates survived the inquiry because of his allies in Congress, he never held another command. With nothing opposing him, Cornwallis moved into North Carolina to raise a large army of loyalists. With the emergency growing in the South, Washington sent one of his ablest generals, Nathaniel Green, along with 1,000 Continentals, to rebuild the Southern Department and prevent Cornwallis from conquering the South. Green, a 38-year-old Rhode Island Quaker who abandoned his faith's pacifist stance to join the American cause, had matured as a general during the war. His first taste of battle came at Long Island, where he constructed fortifications to oppose a British amphibious landing. To his horror and shame, his fortifications did not even slow the British down and could only watch as his men surrendered. His failure soon forced the Americans to abandon New York City. Since that debacle, Green learnt to avoid facing the British head-on, instead favouring harassing the British until he could face them on a ground of Green's own choosing. Green now faced the monumental task of rebuilding the Southern Department and challenging Cornwallis. Since his victory at Camden, Cornwallis's campaign met disappointment. The number of loyalists flocking to the king's banner was lower than expected, and those who did join were ambushed at the king's mountain near the North and South Carolina border by Patriot militia. The loyalists were completely defeated, and with them Cornwallis's hopes for conquering North Carolina. Another setback came from Virginia. The traitor Benedict Arnold, now a British general, landed in Virginia on January 1st, 1781 with a force of 1,600 and proceeded to burn the capital of Richmond, narrowly missed Governor Thomas Jefferson and then rampaged through the state. Washington, unable to defend his home state in person, ordered the Marquis de Lafayette to join with the Baron von Steuben to oppose Arnold. After several months with neither side holding the advantage, Arnold suffered a severe attack of gout and returned to New York. His surviving men would later join Cornwallis at Yorktown. His frustrations growing, Cornwallis sought to destroy Green's army and resume his campaign. Green, meanwhile, divided his army and ordered Daniel Morgan to gather supplies and men, while Green continued to rebuild his main force. This attracted Cornwallis's attention, and he sent Banastra Tarleton, his cavalry commander, to crush Morgan. On January the 17th, 1781, the British caught up to the Americans at Cowpens, South Carolina. Tarleton planned a direct frontal assault with most of his infantry, expecting the American Continentals and militia to break before his British regulars. Morgan understood the militia's tendency to break under pressure, on the night before the battle, soldier Thomas Young recounted that Morgan told the militia, Just hold your heads, boys, three fires, and you are free, and then when you return to your homes, how the old folks will bless you and the girls kiss you for your gallant conduct. The militia targeted officers first to cause chaos in the British ranks, and then broke as instructed, leading Tarleton to order a cavalry charge to finish them off. Suddenly, out of nowhere, came Colonel William Washington's dragoons, and soon all of Tarleton's men were engaged. The Continentals maintained a withering fire, halting the British advance, while the militia reappeared from their fainted retreat on the British flank. Colonel John Howard wrote, While the British were in this confusion, I ordered a charge with the bayonet, which order was obeyed with great alacrity. 
The British line collapsed. Some surrendered on the spot, while others ran for their lives. The Americans suffered around 70 to 130 casualties, while the British lost close to 1,000 men. The Battle of Cowpens ended British hopes for victory in the South. Cornwallis would continue to chase Green in order to turn the tide, but every skirmish or battle cost Cornwallis men he could not replace. At Guildford Courthouse on March the 15th, near present-day Greensboro, North Carolina, the British won a Pyrrhic victory as they held the field, but suffered heavy casualties and could no longer maintain the offensive. In Parliament, opposition leader Charles James Fox said of the battle, Another such victory would ruin the British army. Green, whose reassembled army outnumbered the British more than two to one, could applaud his men for inflicting heavy casualties and maintaining an orderly retreat. Cornwallis, however, experienced the same frustrations as every other British general in America. Although defeated, the Americans lived to fight another day. Cornwallis moved north into Virginia, hoping to link up with Arnold, but this plan was foiled when Arnold sailed for New York and Lafayette marched south. Cornwallis was never in favour of the move to Yorktown. He moved into Virginia as he saw the state as the linchpin to controlling all of the southern states and from where Green received the bulk of his supplies. While Clinton was against the move into Virginia, Cornwallis received support from Lord George Germain, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, to begin raiding operations. There, Benedict Arnold's army fell under Cornwallis's command and the British continued to march north. Meanwhile, British positions in Georgia and South Carolina collapsed as the Patriots retook those states, aside from the cities of Savannah, Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina. Clinton then ordered Cornwallis to march to Yorktown and construct a naval post for the fleet. Clinton also requested Cornwallis send a portion of his troops to New York, as Clinton feared a French-American assault on the city. Cornwallis ignored the order to send troops north. Instead, he launched skirmishes against Lafayette, which prevented him from surrounding Yorktown. Meanwhile, outside New York, Washington and Rochambeau planned their next move. Washington received dispatches from Lafayette, who urged Washington come south to take command. Washington, however, felt his position outside New York was more vital to the cause than the defence of his home state. Washington still urged an attack on New York with assistance from the French Navy because he believed a victory at New York could be the most capable of striking a death blow to Britain's dominion in America. Rochambeau, though too diplomatic to tell Washington to his face, opposed an attack on New York. To ensure Washington saw the error of his plans, Rochambeau urged Admiral de Grasse in the West Indies to sail his fleet north, not to New York, but to the Chesapeake. Rochambeau wrote, The enemy is making his strongest effort in Virginia. The southwesterly winds and the state of distress in Virginia will probably make you prefer the Chesapeake Bay, and it will be there where we think you may be able to render the greatest service, whereas you will need only two days to come from there to New York. Though he could not spend an extended period away from the West Indies, de Grasse agreed to support a campaign against the British in the Chesapeake. Armed with this response, Rochambeau urged Washington to consider a move south to launch a joint operation with the French fleet. Despite his desire to launch an attack on New York, Washington knew he needed to take advantage of French naval support. He abandoned his plans for New York and prepared the army for the march to Virginia. This march had to be carefully planned, as they could not let the British know they were on the move, lest Clinton decide to attack. On August the 19th, the march to Yorktown began. Washington left behind a portion of his army to protect the Hudson Valley and to avoid rousing British suspicions. They marched south through New Jersey, passing through Trenton and Princeton, 
the sites of early American victories. Even after hearing of the march, Clinton refused to move. He wrote to Cornwallis, I cannot well ascertain Mr Washington's real intentions by this move of his army. He assumed the Americans were returning to their winter quarters at Morristown, New Jersey. Only by the time the Americans and French had reached Philadelphia was Clinton certain Washington and Rochambeau were marching to Yorktown. The Americans and French paraded through Philadelphia during the first days of September. In front of cheering crowds, members of Congress and the commanders of the armies the French marched in perfect order, their pristine white uniforms cleaned for this very occasion. The appearance of the American troops in their ragged uniforms that hung loosely over their gaunt bodies shocked many in attendance. The people could see the toll that years of sacrifice had taken on the soldiers, while the congressmen in attendance could grasp what their indecision and lack of support had done to the army. Anger from within the American ranks grew as they continued to be without pay while their leaders in Philadelphia sacrificed very little. This caused another emergency within the army as some 2,000 troops refused to march any further unless they were paid. However, the soldiers did not understand how little money the Continental Congress actually had. There was no money to pay the troops. Sensing how the growing crisis could affect the campaign, Robert Morris, the overworked financier of the revolution, used the last of his personal credit to raise enough money to pay the army. Washington glumly departed Philadelphia, but he was soon to receive news that would bring confidence back into the campaign. Washington wrote to Lafayette on September the 2nd, but, my dear Marquis, I am distressed beyond expression to know what is become of the Count de Grasse, and for fear of the English fleet, by occupying the Chesapeake, should frustrate all our flattering prospects in that quarter. Washington may not have known where the French fleet was, but the British did, as their fleet under Admiral Sir Thomas Graves shadowed de Grasse for several days without bringing the French to battle. On September the 5th, the British chose to attack de Grasse's fleet before they could be reinforced by Admiral Comte de Barras, sailing south from Newport with siege equipment. The battle lasted until sundown as de Grasse's 24 ships of the line exchanged raking fire with 19 British ships. The British suffered over 300 casualties and six ships were heavily damaged, the French suffered only two damaged ships. That evening, Graves assessed the condition of his fleet and, after consulting with his officers, decided to return to New York. Graves was unwilling to risk losing more ships and therefore be unable to save Cornwallis. The next day, an exhausted dispatch rider reached Washington with the news of de Grasse's arrival in the Chesapeake. Upon hearing of the arrival of the French fleet, Washington was overcome with delight. Rochambeau found the normally stoic American waving his hat and a white handkerchief joyfully. Washington shouted the news and embraced Rochambeau. Word quickly spread through the armies, and they continued the march south with renewed vigour. On September the 14th, Washington, after spending several days' rest at his home at Mount Vernon, entered Williamsburg, the old capital of Virginia and the site of Lafayette's headquarters. The confusing orders from Clinton and Cornwallis's own hopes to be reinforced by sea kept the British in Yorktown despite its unfavourable position and growing enemy numbers. Lafayette did not have enough troops to prevent a breakout but with Washington's arrival at the head of his army and Comte de Barras's fleet with siege equipment and troops, the British were surrounded. On September the 28th, Washington marched his combined force of over 8,000 Continentals, 7,800 Frenchmen and over 3,000 Virginia militia to Yorktown. One American soldier, Joseph Plum Martin, wrote... We prepared to move down and pay our old acquaintance, the British at Yorktown, a visit. I doubt not but their wish was not to have so many of us come at once, as their accommodations were rather scanty. 
there was still much to do before the siege could begin. The American artillery, commanded by the bookseller-turned-self-taught artillerist Henry Knox, had not yet arrived at Yorktown. Washington feared an extended period of inactivity might encourage de Grasse to sail his fleet back to the West Indies and urge Knox to hurry with all haste. After reviewing the British works and seeing the weakness of the British position, Washington believed that once all of the artillery was in place, he could pummel the British into submission. The first fighting of the siege took place across the York River at the town of Gloucester. Colonel Tarleton commanded the British outpost, and it provided an avenue of escape for the British unless the Allies besieged it, along with Yorktown. The two sides immediately engaged in skirmishes on the road to Gloucester, with Tarleton barely escaping a French cavalry charge before both sides retreated back to their respective lines. Both sides settled in for the siege. The Americans and French cut down trees to create earthworks, while British artillery prevented the Allies from moving too close. Neither side understood Cornwallis's motivation for remaining at Yorktown. When the British and German soldiers abandoned the outer defences, they expected to pull out of Yorktown altogether. Instead, Cornwallis merely shortened his defensive lines as he still held out for rescue. The British, abandoning their outer lines, allowed the Americans and French to build gun emplacements within range of Yorktown. They began building the trenches on October the 6th, with Washington ceremoniously digging the first trench. Through the next few days, both sides exchanged musket fire as the British tried to prevent the construction of parallel lines. The British even launched several raids against the unarmed sappers, which caused delays on the work, but could not deter the Allies. On October the 9th, Washington fired the first shot of the siege, where legend had it that the ball smashed into a table where the British officers were eating. Washington ordered a continuous bombardment of British positions to prevent them from repairing the works during the night. The British guns could not keep up the fire and soon were destroyed by Knox's accurate gunnery. The next day, the governor of Virginia, Thomas Nelson, was asked by Lafayette where he preferred the Americans direct their artillery. There, replied Nelson, to that house. It is mine. There you will be almost certain to find Lord Cornwallis and the British headquarters. Fire upon it, my dear Marquis, and never spare a particle of my property so long as it affords a comfort or shelter to the enemies of my country. The Nelson house was duly destroyed and the British position became more desperate. Before burning most of the remaining British ships still in the harbour and sealing himself off from the outside world, Cornwallis received several letters from Clinton who informed Cornwallis that he was sending reinforcements from New York and they should arrive by October the 12th. Cornwallis believed that would be too late. He wrote to Clinton, my situation now becomes very critical. We dare not shoe a gun to their old batteries and I expect that their new ones will open tomorrow morning. The safety of this place is therefore so precarious that I cannot recommend that the fleet and the army should run great risk in endeavouring to save us. Indeed, the Americans dug a second parallel 400 yards closer to the British lines which tightened their grip on the town and brought more guns to bear on British positions. The British held two positions which the French and Americans needed to take before they could move closer to Yorktown, redoubts number 9 and 10. The attacks on the redoubts were preceded by a massive bombardment on the British and German lines to weaken the defences. The French also launched small diversionary attacks to draw the defenders away from redoubt number 9. On October the 14th, 400 French troops awaited the signal guns to fire. The Comte de Dupont led his regiment forward. The six shells were fired at last and I advanced in the greatest silence. At 120 or 30 paces, we were discovered. We lost not a moment in reaching the abates, which, being strong and well preserved at about 25 paces from the redoubt, cost us many men and stopped us for some minutes, but was cleared away with brave determination. 
The French climbed over the walls of the redoubt in the face of a German charge. The Germans fell back after a French volley and soon surrendered when the French prepared a bayonet charge. The French carried the redoubt in less than half an hour with the loss of 15 killed and 77 wounded. On the other side of the line, the Americans, led by Alexander Hamilton, attacked the British-held redoubt number 10. They did so with muskets unloaded and bayonets fixed. The British heard the Americans coming and directed sharp fire on the attackers. Joseph Plum Martin wrote, We were now at a place where many of our large shells had burst in the ground, making holes sufficient to bury an ox in. The men were every now and then falling into these holes. The Americans rushed forward as they refused to be slaughtered in the shell holes. They surged over the walls and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the British defenders. The Americans overwhelmed the British, and those that survived ran to the safety of Yorktown. The two last obstacles facing the French and Americans were eliminated. Facing this new reality and watching his defences crumble around him, Cornwallis had two choices. He could transfer his army to Gloucester, where, with Tarleton's men, the British would have the strength to attempt to break out, or Cornwallis could surrender his army. Either way, Yorktown was lost. On October the 15th, the British made one more attempt to check the enemy advance. Cornwallis targeted the nearest Allied position with all of his artillery, while Lieutenant Colonel Robert Abercrombie led a storming party of 350 men to spike the American guns. In the early morning hours, they slipped across the battlefield and attacked the sleeping French and American soldiers. Abercrombie shouted to his men, Push on, boys, and skin the bastards! As they spiked the guns, most of the Virginia militia fled, and the British looked to penetrate deeper into the Allied lines, until the French rallied and checked the British. Abercrombie led his men back to Yorktown in victory. The victory was short-lived, however, when the guns were soon repaired and new units took the place of the routed militia. Cornwallis now attempted the evacuation of Yorktown. He would transfer his men to Gloucester and, through a series of forced marches, would make his way to New York. As more Allied batteries began firing on Yorktown, the British gathered all available boats for the trek across the York River. On the night of the 16th, the troops began the transfer. Some were able to make the crossing before a severe storm prevented further crossings. The weary and now wet troops returned to man the defensive lines. Cornwallis would later write of his situation on the 16th. We at this time could not fire a single gun. Only one eight-inch and little more than a hundred cohorn shells remained. Under these circumstances, I thought it would have been wanton and inhuman to the last degree to sacrifice the lives of this small body of gallant soldiers. The next morning, as the shells continued to fall on Yorktown, a drummer appeared on the rampart and beat the signal for parley. When the firing did not stop, an officer followed the drummer, waving a white handkerchief. The guns were silenced. Cornwallis sent Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dundas and Major Alexander Ross to negotiate with Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence and the Marquis de Noailles. At Washington's behest, Cornwallis proposed his terms for capitulation. Because of their heroic defence of Yorktown, Cornwallis believed his men deserved the full honours of war, march out with muskets shouldered, flags flying, and the band playing the enemy tune as a tribute to the victors. The officers and men would be paroled and returned to Britain until the cessation of hostilities. Washington denied these requests, instead offering the same terms to which the Americans under Benjamin Lincoln at Charleston were forced to submit. The British were to march out of their defences, stack arms, their flags furled, and playing a British tune. The British commissioners were shocked by such terms and urged a change. Colonel Lawrence responded, This remains an article, or I cease to be a commissioner. Essentially, sign the articles, or we open fire. Reluctantly, the British signed. On October the 19th, the British and Germans suddenly marched out of their defences. Some openly wept while others appeared drunk. 
Some soldiers angrily threw down their muskets or bashed the guns into the ground, hoping to destroy them rather than let them fall into enemy hands. Dr. James Thatcher, an American surgeon, wrote of the surrender, Every eye was prepared to gaze on Lord Cornwallis, the object of particular interest and solicitude, but he disappointed our anxious expectations. Pretending in disposition, he made General Charles O'Hara his substitute as the leader of his army. O'Hara first attempted to present Cornwallis's sword to Rochambeau, but was informed that the French were subordinate to Washington. Washington then appointed his second-in-command, General Lincoln, to accept the surrender. Lincoln took the sword, looked it over, and returned it to O'Hara. In all, near 8,000 infantry, over 200 artillery pieces, 24 transport ships, and countless wagons and horses were surrendered. The loyalists in the British camp fled, as they were not protected under the Articles of Capitulation. Some refugees were allowed to sail to New York City, where along the way they met the British fleet under Admiral Graves. Clinton finally decided to send reinforcements, but they were too late. Cornwallis wrote to Clinton, Sir, I have the mortification to inform your Excellency that I have been forced to give up the posts of York and Gloucester, and to surrender the troops under my command by capitulation on the 19th, as prisoners of war to the combined forces of America and France. The victory at Yorktown came none too soon for the fledgling United States. The victory was celebrated for days in Philadelphia. After the British marched off to captivity, the French departed for the West Indies and Washington led his army back to New York. The stalemate continued. Green, who prevented the British in Charleston from reinforcing Yorktown, fought a series of small battles, but both sides maintained the status quo. On September the 3rd, 1783, almost two years after Yorktown, British and American representatives signed the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war and granted the United States their independence. Yorktown proved to be the beginning of the end of the American War of Independence. Lord North's ministry collapsed and the new Whig administration was more willing to negotiate. They ordered the army to cease all offensive campaigns as peace talks picked up in Paris. Clinton was recalled to London to answer for his failures and Sir Guy Charlton, the governor of Quebec, was appointed commander in New York. Holding on to the American colonies was no longer worth the effort. Yorktown proved to be the final straw. The British could not lose two field armies and justify the continuation of an expensive war. On November the 25th, 1783, as the British evacuated New York City, they watched the Union Jack be torn down from its pole in Battery Park on the tip of Manhattan and replaced by the Stars and Stripes. The upstart Americans could have their independence and see if they could survive without the protection and resources of the British Empire. Now, in a moment, we'll preview what's coming up in Episode 7. But first, as you heard at the start of this episode, it is brought to you by lynda.com. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com. And the offer we brought you a while ago is still on a totally free 10-day trial of all lynda.com content by going to lynda.com forward slash history net. There's also a link on the homepage of the website, so you can use that too if you like. It's already nearly March, and how are those New Year's resolutions you made a couple of months ago going? Perhaps one of them was to learn something new, to finally get around to teaching yourself how to, well, only you know what you need. And the chances are that whatever you need to learn is available as a top quality piece of learning from lynda.com. So what better reason could there be for you to start learning something new quickly and easily at lynda.com with this free 10-day trial offer. lynda.com is used by millions of people around the world and has over 3,000 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress and Photoshop. All of their courses are taught by experts and new courses are added on the site every week. 
whether you want to set new financial goals, find a work-life balance, invest in a new hobby, ask your boss for a raise, find a new job or improve upon your current job skills in 2015, lynda.com has something for everyone. So here's all you need to do. Sign up for your free 10-day trial today by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net and you will get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com access to view tutorials on tablets and iphone plus android mobile devices and access to any new courses added every week angus and i have used lynda.com over the years as we've developed the history network and expanded it to produce the ancient warfare magazine podcast We've also used it in our day job lives as well. As you'll probably know already, the History Network is a spare time operation for Angus and myself. And the beauty is that it's always easy to find what you're looking for. And the content is always there and available if you need to refer to it once in a while or again and again. So go on, invest in yourself and sign up for a free 10 day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net we challenge you to learn something new in 2015. Now, coming up in Episode 7, we'll be taking a look at gas warfare in World War I. This episode by Angus takes a look at some statistics about the actual effects of the gas, as well as the psychological fear it produced. For example, did you know the idea of using gas as a weapon predates the First World War? Indeed, the Hague Convention of 1899 outlawed the use of projectiles whose sole purpose was the diffusion of asphyxiating or deleterious gases. With the exception of the United States, all the major powers signed the agreement. So join us in a couple of weeks as we take a look at gas warfare of World War I. Now would you like to write a script for us on a topic we've not covered yet? And in fact, perhaps we have covered a topic in overview form, and you've got a real passion for some detail of that. Or perhaps, conversely, we've looked in at the detail of something, and you've got a great overall knowledge surrounding that which would make a great podcast. Whatever it is, why not drop us a line with your idea? Some of our most popular episodes have been written by listeners. You can help support us in a number of ways. There is, of course, the donate button at the website, thehistorynetwork.org. You can also find our past seasons there, which are chaptered files for download, and each of them has a running time of anywhere between a couple of hours up to around five hours, and you will pay just £2 for each of these. We'd love it as well if you get involved on the social side. Just search for The History Network on Facebook and like our page on there, and you can follow us on Twitter. We are at History Network on Twitter. We've also got a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash the history network. Here we've got various video content, including the Ancient Warfare magazine podcasts. And this season, we're also releasing this podcast via YouTube. So do go and have a look. And if you'd like to let us know what you think, or give us some ideas about podcast subjects, want to write a script for us, want to bring us up on an error or point of contention, then whatever it is, it's info at the History Network for that. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to The History Network, written by Michael Gaby-Gross, read by Nick Barker. (laughs) 